Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. In his book entitled Journey to Freedom, Dr. Richard Dorst writes of a priest who had a secret burden of sin. This priest had long ago genuinely repented of this sin, and it was a heartfelt repentance, but yet he couldn't shake the feeling of guilt. The priest found it incredibly difficult to receive and accept God's mercy and forgiveness as he preached. In this priest congregation, there was a woman who claimed to have the ear of the Lord, visions where the Lord would speak to her directly. And the priest was quite skeptical of her claims. One day after service, he told her, you know, the next time you have one of these visions from the Lord and he starts talking to you, I want you to ask him a question. I want you to ask the Lord what sin I committed 20 years ago in seminary. The woman said, okay, if the Lord lets me know, I'll let you know. The following Sunday after church, the priest stopped the woman and he said, well, did Jesus visit you? Did he talk to you? Did he tell you that sin I committed 20 years ago? She said, oh, yes, actually, he, he did talk to me. Well, what did he say? The woman looked at the priest and said, well, God said he forgot. And so should you. Certainly, the priest, I don't think, is alone. As a pastor whose God-given job it is to come up here every Sunday and proclaim to you the absolutely free grace and salvation of God for all of your sins, past, present, and future, I'd be lying if I said that I often don't struggle with forgiveness myself. That there aren't many things in my past, my sins, that I don't often wonder, does he really forgive that? Did he forgive it the second and third time I asked for forgiveness too? And I don't have to have you tell me for me to know that each and every one of you struggles with that also. We all have those sins, whether it's something 20 years ago or something that happened on the way in this morning that haunt us. Why is it that we struggle so much with forgiveness? Why is it that even as those who genuinely believe in Christ and the absolute mercy of God and proclaim that to the world, that we can still cling so tightly to guilt and shame? Well, according to Scripture, it's because forgiveness isn't in our nature that we don't sin just because we do bad things and not do good things, we sin because we are sinful in nature, in our very substance. And because of that, we don't have the capacity on our own. We don't even have a frame of ref reference to quantify the eternal, immeasurable mercy and grace and love of God that has no bounds, no limits, Thousands of years ago and hundreds of years before our Savior, Jesus, was born, God foretold about the truly unimaginable love that he was going to bring through his servant son. And as you read through this particular prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 52 and 53, you can almost hear as God writes through Isaiah, Isaiah himself struggling with this whole idea of God's unimaginable and quite frankly absurd love and forgiveness. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 52, God speaks about the servant king of salvation that he'd be sending into the world to save it. And he says, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I can only speak for myself here, but I struggle with forgiveness because when I read a prophecy like that of my Lord Jesus, I know that that's what I deserve. But that description should not be fitting of him but me. Because if it's based off of my own merits, if God were to break out the scales, there's no reason I should be saved. We know in our hearts that we would never love our enemies as God has loved us. We know in our hearts we would not be as patient and long-suffering as God has been with us. We know that had we been in God's place, we would have never thought about doing what he has done for us. Most of us believe we wouldn't hesitate to sacrifice our own life for someone we love and that loves us back. But to sacrifice your love for people that hate you, that want to hurt you, that's absurd. To our carnal, selfish, sinful minds, we cannot understand why Christ would leave heaven. You would leave all that the, perfect, the perfection of heaven to come down here and do what? Why? But it's the very absurdity of God's love and forgiveness that testifies to its truth because that kind of love can only come from God. There were many times throughout their walk with Jesus that the disciples found themselves bewildered by this freedom and grace and mercy, forgiveness of God. And one of those times is in our text today from Luke 17. Jesus says to them, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. I'd say Jesus is pretty serious, wouldn't you? I mean, if drowning yourself in the ocean is better than whatever God would do if you caused someone to sin, then I would have to think we're talking about some serious temptations to sin, like tempting someone to murder, tempting someone to steal, tempting someone to commit adultery, well, that might be what we think, but Jesus says something very different. He says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. See, Jesus wasn't warning his disciples about leading people with the temptation to lie, cheat, and steal. Jesus was warning his disciples not to bring temptation into the lives of others, either by failing to call sin, sin, and call it into account, or by failing to forgive when someone repents. We've got the first of those two down packed, don't we? Rebuke sin, no problem, Lord. You just point me in the right direction and I'll call sin out when I see it. It's that second one that's hard. 
forgiving. The disciples no doubt realized how hard and impossible for them that it is to do what Jesus was asking them to do. And so they cry out to Jesus. They say, increase our faith. The Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Whether they realized it or not at the time, the disciples had asked for the exact right thing. You cannot forgive as I have forgiven you unless you have faith. And to understand the magnitude of what Jesus is talking about, you need to know what a mulberry tree is. A mulberry tree is not some little tree that you plant in your garden in your backyard. This was a tree that had very, very deep roots, and because of that was usually planted along the long wilderness walkways people used to to travel across the Holy Land because those deep roots would always ensure water and it would have a huge canopy that would be used for shade and rest. Jesus said, if you had a mustard seed worth of faith, that mulberry tree would come out of the ground and be cast into the sea. Now, how can a mustard seed worth of faith do that? Well, the faith can't. Not faith in quantity in me. But just a mustard seed worth of faith in him. A mustard seed worth of faith in what he has done for you. That the same God who spoke everything into creation, even that mulberry tree, said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. Has forgiven us. Faith in God's perfectly absurd grace and mercy is what compels us to love absurdly. The same God who said, and it was, said, it's finished. All of it. Even the sins you can't remember. In other words, if you're refusing forgiveness to someone who has repented, even if they come to you seven times in the day for the same sin then you aren't paying close enough attention to yourself. You have forgotten what the Lord has forgiven you and continues to forgive. Forgiving is difficult for a long list of reasons, not the least of which, in my opinion, is fear. Fear that if I forgive this person, it's going to give them license to do it again. Fear that I'm somehow endorsing it by forgiving it. Fear that I'm going to get hurt again if I forgive again. The absurdity of forgiving others is only possible when we have faith, even a mustard seed worth of faith. And the absolute absurd and absolute total forgiveness that you have already received yourself from Christ. That it should have been us on the cross, it should have been us in the tomb, but it wasn't. And Christ not only tells us that we must forgive because we have been forgiven, but he says you must forgive because he wants us to be truly free. Not free just from our own sin, which we can believe, but free also from other people's sins that cause bitterness and anger, resentment, The true story of a World War II Japanese fighter pilot named Mitsuo Fuchida, I think, is a beautiful illustration of the freedom that Christ wants for us and commands us to have through the forgiveness of others. Mitsuo Fuchida was the infamous Japanese fighter pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 1st, 1941. In the summer of 1942, Six or seven months later, Mr. Fuchida was in the sick bay of a Japanese ship out on the ocean. And as he was in there being tended to, the 
ship was blown apart by a bomb. He was the only survivor of everybody on board. He was later transferred to a rehabilitation center in Hiroshima, where after he finished his rehab, he left, and four days later, America dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Twice, he had escaped death. And if you've ever been in that position, you know that that can be an intense mental and emotional struggle, especially when so many other people die. And in his book that he wrote, entitled From Pearl Harbor to Calvary, Fuchida says, why was my life spared a second time? When the war ended several days later, my country was defeated and I was devastated. Bitterness and hatred filled my heart. In the book, he recounts how several days later he was going through a train station and there was a guy handing out pamphlets and he received one of those pamphlets and it was entitled, I was a prisoner of Japan. And Mr. Fuchida opened that pamphlet and read the story about an American soldier named Jake DeShazer who was imprisoned in Japan, tortured, but who after being released came to know Jesus Christ and then went back to Japan to witness grace and mercy and the gospel to his captors. A few days later in that same train station, Fuchida met another man handing out a Bible and he received that Bible and as Fuchida writes in his book, it was that day that he became a new creation by faith in Christ. And then Fuchida traveled the world evangelizing the gospel especially in Japan, countless people coming to faith through Fuchida and his testimony. Fuchida was deeply grateful for everything that God had given him, but Fuchida still felt something was missing. He longed for forgiveness, not from God, but from Jake DeShazer, the one who ultimately gave him that pamphlet Fuchida recounts how he tracked down Mr. DeShazer and eventually found his home address and just showed up one day, knocked on the door, hands trembling. Fuchida recounts how the door opened and there was this very simple, soft-looking man who said, yes, how can I help you? He said, my name is Mitsuo Fuchida and I have been longing to meet you for a very long time, Mr. DeShazer. Fuchida said it only took about three seconds for him to know exactly who I was. And he said, please come in. And for the rest of that day, they ate together, shared stories together. And as Fuchida writes in his book, through the love of Jesus, we former enemies embraced as brothers in Christ's love. One soldier was a prisoner in Japan. The other soldier became a prisoner of shame and guilt. Both were set free only when their faith in Christ was properly placed. Both were able to forgive only when they had faith in the full forgiveness already given to them through Christ. Scripture says in 1 John 4, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. As I have said many times before and will say many times again, you cannot give to someone else something you do not have yourself. You cannot give something you have not received. And the good news of the gospel is today, our Lord comes again to give you full and complete forgiveness in his own body and blood. Amen.